Good evening, church. Good to see you tonight. <clears throat> Glad to see y'all could come, come out on a Wednesday night. Amen? <clears throat> let's look at uh, Psalms 42, and then let's go to Acts chapter 16. So we'll be Old and New Testament tonight. If you don't have your Bible, look on a Christian. You'll see here a Christian's got theirs with them. Just kidding. A copy of God's Word tonight. And let's we'll flip there together. It's going to be good. We're going to be talking about hope tonight, okay? I got one request. Will you smile tonight during, just periodically, just drop me a smile. Amen? Just every now and again. I like smiley people. That's a good thing. Remember, it doesn't matter if it's your teeth um, or the ones that you bought, they're yours. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. We're glad to have it because it's hard to eat an apple without them. But I know my granddaddy could eat an apple with his gum. Amen? He really could. They tell me that story all the time. But you know, another thing I would love for us to go back to doing, too, is um, bobbing for apples. Do you remember that? We've talked about that there, but wouldn't bobbing for apples be good? Because remember, used to, if you bob for apples, you would always go after the apple that had the most teeth marks in it because that's the one everybody tried to get. Do you remember that? Y'all don't remember that. I mean, y'all going to be a hostile crowd tonight. Amen. That's good. But hey, the, the topic tonight is a good thing. It's hope. So I have hope tonight that things are going to turn out better than they are right now. Amen? It's going to be good. Amen? It's good to be here. All right, so we're looking at hope tonight. I'm going to go to Psalms 42, look at the psalmist for a minute. Um, I want to read these verses and then kind of set the tone or set the mood for hope and looking at this dynamic of the church tonight. Psalm 42, verse 1. It says that as the heart panteth after the water... Brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God. Now, a question for you. You got to think about it. Do you know what it's like for your heart to be thirsty for God? Just think about that for a minute. Your heart to be thirsty, to have such a thirst or appetite, or it's, it's really to have a craving for God. You ever had your mouth so dry before and just that bottle of water or that ice cold water, that tap, it was so refreshing, wasn't it? And so what happens is, is sometimes when you just get dry and you get that water, man, it is something else. I mean, it just, you know, so refreshing. That's what it's saying. When you get thirsty, God can refresh you. All right, but look at this thirsty. Number two, it says, for the living God, when shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day, and it says, and night. It says, while they continually say unto me, where is thy God? Now, what he's talking about is his enemy. His enemy is saying, where is your God? Well, we all know that sometimes God can seem silent to us. We pray, nothing happens. And we even ask the question, say, Lord, where are you? Lord, what is it that I have done or not done that causes this gap and so sometimes we ask that question if, if you believe that tonight if you've ever been there tonight say amen there's times you kind of just wonder where is the lord in verse 4 it says when i remember these things i pour out my soul in me for i had gone with the multitude i went with them to the house of god with the voice of joy and praise with a multitude that kept that holy day. What he's saying is that even sometimes when you go to church, sometimes when you get together, you're just not feeling it. It just seems like something has changed or, or whatnot, and you kind of just wonder, where has that love and feeling gone to? You know that there's times in your Christianity that you'll feel like you're on top of the mountain. And then sometimes in your Christianity, you'll think that they used all of that dirt with the mountain to bury you. And so sometimes you feel like you're underneath the mountain. But God is teaching us something through this process here. Look at verse 5. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted or turmoil in me? Hope thou in God. That's key. Hope in God. For I shall yet... Praise him for the help of his countenance. Oh, my God, verse 6, my soul is cast down within me. 
what it's saying is sometimes that soul in us, okay? We've got to get this part here. Sometimes that soul will be just overwhelmed with the Holy Spirit. It'll, be, it'll just be full. There's a, you know, we express it with a lot of different words and try to describe it. But sometimes, man, you can leave and it's just you feel like you're just full of the Holy Spirit. But then sometimes you'll think you had leaked out. And, and you know, D.L. Moody said one time, Lord, fill me up with the Spirit because sometimes I leak. And so what happens is you'll feel like there's a hole in the bottom. And so what he's saying is that I feel like my soul has been cast down inside of me. I feel like my world has been turned upside down. And he goes on to say that, Therefore I will remember thee in the land of Jordan and of the Hermonites from the hill. Mazar, it says, verse 7, Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of the water spouts. All thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. Feels like I'm just drowning here. Feels like I'm just being consumed by the elements. It says that in verse 8, yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night his song shall be with me. Now listen now, there's something fixing to change here because he's saying that even though I feel like I'm all alone and that my enemy it feels like they have an upper hand on me or circumstance or life. He's saying, I still have my song. You know, you still have something to sing about. And so that is very important, church, that you realize this, that you still have that song when you feel all alone. Mm-hmm. All right. Then it says, it says, your song shall be with me. And then he goes on to say, and my prayer unto God of my life. I, I will say unto God my rock. Notice how he's describing that. He's saying, listen, the Lord, he's my rock, you know. He's something that is strong and stable and steadfast, you know, something that you can hold on to. It says, why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I or why do I mourn because of the oppression of the enemy? Now what he's saying is that the enemy and the circumstances of life can seem to be bigger than you are. Seems that things just weighing in. You and I both know that when it rains, it pours. And when the, it's like a domino effect. When one thing happens or hits, here it comes, one after the other. And then you kind of like Jerry Clower said that time up in the tree there with that line. He said, just shoot up amongst us. It don't matter if you hit me or it. I just need some relief. Amen. That's when you kind of get to that place, Lord, heal me or kill me. <laughs> it don't make no difference. Because either way, I need some relief from what's going on in my life, or I need to see you, Jesus. Amen? And so sometimes we get to a place like that. Can I get a witness? And so that's what happens. Sometimes. Look at verse 10. He says, as with a sword in my bones, my enemy reproached me. He said, man, it is painful. And it goes deep. While they say daily unto me, where is thy God? Verse 11. In final verse, it says, why art thou cast down? We said this earlier. He repeats it. O my soul, why art thou disquieted or turmoil within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. Let's flip over to Acts 16. What he's saying here, the psalmist is saying, is the only way I'm going to be able to get out of this funk, the only way that I'm going to be able to overcome, is I got to find hope in my life. Now, I will tell you, hope is key. Um, it, it's really cool, you know, because when that new building is finished and everything, that building is actually being called Hope after Brother Reedy Severn, you know. And so that's really cool that we're building a building of hope, and that's really good, you know. But, but what happens here is he's saying, all right, this helps you with the dynamics, okay, of, of uh, being a dynamic church, is that every one of us tonight need to be able to find hope, all right? Sometimes we can lose that along the way. See, when everything's going good, then you don't have many worries. 
Now, if you've lived this faith long enough and, and you live Christian, but now listen, what you've got to do is be able to exclude the world for a minute. Now, I know you know what living in the world's like. But what I'm saying is, do you know what it's like living apart from the world? That's a different, different, different story. And what it's called is how to live your faith in this world. Then does it mean that you are free from the troubles and the trials of this world? The Lord actually even promised you, you're going to get persecuted because you're a Christian. He's promised us that as much as he has heaven. But he's saying is that when you get ready and you down at your lowest place in your life, when you down as low as you can go, he says you need to be looking for hope. You know, and what that means is hope, is going to be the connecting. If you notice what he said was, he says, hope is what is going to connect me to my Lord. Hope is what's going to help my soul stand tall in me when I find the Lord. And so this hope here is really, really important. Now let's go to Acts chapter 16 and let's look at a character story for a moment. Very familiar story. We've referenced it here a few times here of late. And what it's talking about is Paul and Silas. You know, we've talked about that several times, no stranger to that story. But what he's saying is, is that Paul and Silas gets there, you know, there's this fortune teller. Paul has the power of the Holy Spirit. He goes in there and he prays. This woman's over there, she's doing witchcraft. And what happens? Paul comes over there and he prays. He prays the devil out of her. And, uh... Don't you wish you had that ability? Holy, oh, amen. It, it'd be good sometime to be able to help old sassy britches out. Amen? Amen. Get on out of there, you know. Devil, you need to get up out of them britches, you know. Amen? There ain't nothing but room for her. You need to get out of there, you know. Amen? And, and get the devil out of there, you know. And, and same thing with him. Amen, ladies? <laughs> Y'all's men is living right. Amen? <laughs> or either you scared the devil of him. Amen? But what happens is, you, you, you know, you get, get that big old devil. Listen, if Jesus looked at Peter and said, listen, Simon Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Remember when he was talking against the crucifixion and what was yet to come? He told his head honcho there. He said, listen, he said, get thee behind me, Satan. And, and so what happens is that, that devil will come up. And I'm going to tell you, here is the tactic of the adversary. The tactic of the adversary, all he wants to do is, he's not out to rob your salvation. All he's got to do is rob your hope. Because what does Hebrews 6, 10 tell us? Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10 tells us that the anchor for our soul is one word, hope. He says that hope will take your soul and it will set it down on the rock. See, think about your salvation for a minute. And think about your Savior. You got the gift and here's the giver. Your gift, as we talked about Sunday morning, is your gift is salvation. The Lord has set you free. He has gave you freedom over your sin. He has saved you. He has put your feet on the solid rock. On Jesus is where we stand. But what he's saying is life is going to come and the wind's going to blow and circumstances will set in. But he says what's going to keep your salvation on top of the Savior being rooted is one word and it's called hope. So if you're looking for an anchor in your life to steady you and stabilize you, you need to find hope tonight because hope is the anchor that will hold you to the rock. And so he's saying that things will come and go, but it's going to keep you. And this is what Hebrews 6.10 says right after it states that. The second part of the verse says that he'll keep you sure and steadfast. The anchor will keep you sure and steadfast no matter what comes your way. No matter what comes your way. No matter what comes your way. It'll keep you anchored in your salvation. Watch this. Because listen, let me just play this one. There's some things that can rattle you. You ever been rattled? 
You ever had your teeth jarred? You ever hit that bumper post that was full of concrete with your bumper? I'm here to tell you that I, I don't know from experience. I'm just somebody told me one time that thing will rattle your teeth. Amen. How about that tree that God just planted in your yard last night? How about that one? You know, say God, I, but God, you know you good. You grew that big old oak tree, man. That tree this big around. That thing didn't get planted last night. But you know, he said it come out. God, I don't even know how you come out of nowhere with that tree. Listen. I'm here to tell you, that's what my daughter said the other night when she backed into it with her car over at Jason and Amanda's house. She said, it must be fruitful across the road. What you talking about? They're popping up trees everywhere over there. <laughs> what is she talking about? She come over there. She said, I didn't do that but break one tail light, but she didn't know she had dislocated the other one over there. When you hit something, it gets that over there. And so, but, but what happens is, you know, things will rattle your life. You, you'll find a bumper post in your faith. You'll find a tree in your faith, and it'll rattle you. It'll jar you. It'll, it'll, it'll shock you. It'll take you off guard, and it'll, that's what happens. Your, Satan wants to blindside you. He don't want to You don't see him coming from a long ways off. You can prepare for it. But what happens is, it's boom, and just like that, your world has been hit, and he tries to take advantage of that. Well, we got to remember that we've got hope during this process. All right, so you need to be looking for the hope because let me tell you the thing about a shallow Christian. Shallow Christianity, and guys, you have to understand this now. I'm not sacrilegious, and nor do I try to state anything that's sacrilegious. But if, if all you have in your repertoire as a Christian is to say, oh, I just got to look for Jesus. I'm here to tell you tonight, listen, he said that hope is what's going to keep you in Jesus. So if all you're looking for is just Jesus and you don't have an anchor, you know, that's like you saying, all I got to do is get me a car and I'm good to go. You got to put gas in it. This ain't Flintstones. Amen. I mean, it's just like saying all I get. No, listen, it, you, you got to have, not that you have to have more in Jesus, but you've got to have more in your knowledge of Jesus. That's what we do. We grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus. This is a growth process. We as a church are maturing. We are discipling. We're growing. Like they said uh, last Saturday at the Axis um, conference here, you can't just tag them and bag them. You know, you can't just get somebody saved and say, well, hey, praise the Lord, we'll see you in heaven, buddy. What he's saying is you got to tag them and bag them, and then you got to teach them. What, you know what? I, this is one thing cut to my mind. <clears throat> you got to tag them and bag them, and then you got to take them to the processor. Amen? Isn't that what you do with them? When you go hunting, you tag them and bag them, and you carry them to the processor. What we've got to do is if you've got a tag them and bag them mentality, then you've got to carry them to the processor. Amen? I like that. So what happens is you have to understand that you've got to have this hope. You can't just say, well, I've I got to find Jesus. I've got to find you. No, you need to find your hope right now because your hope is what links you and keeps you to Jesus. Let's look at this here. It says that in, in verse um, 17, this is, I'm going to pick up right here. I've already talked about this soothsaying woman or this fortune teller, witchcraft practicing woman. Look at verse 17. It says, it says that the same followed Paul and us and cried saying, these men are of the servants of the most high God, which show unto us the way of salvation. Now, church, let me, let me give you the first point here with this hope. If, if you're going to have some real, live, solid hope in your life, you got to practice what you preach. Now, I didn't say you're going to perfect it now. But you got to practice what you... What, what they're saying is, now get this now, ready? This woman right here is full of the devil. But this woman has enough knowledge in her to say, hey, you see them two men over there, Paul and Silas? They said, these two men right here actively serve God, and they're trying to share the gospel with us and get us saved. That's what a woman said, full of the devil. 
So this woman, what that means is, if you're going to have the hope that you need to weather the storm, then you've got to be an active Christian. You've got to be a practice Christian. Did you know that your Christianity just don't come naturally? Did, did you know tonight that if you're going to live it, you've got to practice it? You've you got to take Christianity. <clears throat> and see, what it comes down to a lot of the times is when you get there, and, and I know we all fall short. The Bible says we all come short of the glory of God, and I get that. But what happens is you're going to have many times there it is laid out right in front of you and we make our decisions based upon what the Bible tells us to do. That's, that's our navigation. That's what teaches us these things. And so now what happens is this woman comes up here and in verse 17, it teaches us that if we're going to have hope, then we've got to be practicing Christians. Look at verse 17. It says, in the same follow Paul and us, and Christ saying, these men are servants of the Most High God, show unto, the, un, unto us the way of salvation. Verse 18, and this did she many days, but Paul being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and he came out the same hour. All right, so that he, meaning that she had a demon in her. Now, like I said earlier, you don't think that they still people who are possessed with demons? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's people still today. This stuff really happened. Now, you want to know the problem with it? You want to know why it's so widespread? We don't have a problem finding people that's full of the devil. Let's find some people who's full of Jesus. You know why there's so many people full of the devil tonight? Because there's not enough people that's full of Jesus that can cast them out. I mean, you ask yourself a question for a minute. Do you think you got what it takes to cast the devil out? I mean, just, you know, you don't have to answer that out loud. I mean, do you think you got what it takes? I'm going to tell you right now, if you live more like the devil than you do Jesus, I know you don't have what it takes. What it's saying is the reason it's so widespread today is because people ain't got enough Jesus to get rid of enough of that devil. See, Paul cooled her fire. He calmed her right down. And what happened was that made everybody mad. Now, ready? <clears throat> he was a practicing Christian who had hope in Jesus Christ. Now, guess what happens? Now everybody gets mad. They come out. Guess what they do? They take them. And they strip all the clothes off in the middle of the street. So what we got? Humiliation. They take them now and they tie them up to a stake and they beat them. And they beat them bad. And what you got to understand is they beat them so much that they are bleeding and they are bruised. They hurting. And can I tell you, it was one thing to get a beating when you was young. But it's a different story now when you get older. Your body don't heal like it used to. In fact, sometimes you wake up thinking somebody beat you with a stick while you were sleeping. Amen? You don't even have to get beat. You just wake up feeling like you got beat. Amen? And so what happens is, I mean, that stuff gets, like it gets worse the older you get. Amen? And then sometimes you look in the mirror and feel like somebody beat you anyway. Amen? Because that faith don't look like it used to. <laughs> Amen, I'm telling you. It, but listen, it's going to get better after you die. And you, <laughs> Amen. <laughs> hey, I'm telling you, they help you look forward to death. Because the Lord said he's going to renew that body. But that ain't going to happen to you <laughs> die. And in fact, it don't happen then that Jesus comes in the rapture, you know. We have to get that story straight. A lot of people stand at funerals and they say, yeah. Boy, I'm so glad they with Jesus now and got a new body. No, they don't. No, they don't. I hear them all the time at funerals talking about it. I'm sitting in the crowd, but ain't nobody going to stand up and correct them because the family will cry worse. Amen? They ain't going to say nothing. I'm like, man, that man, he got his stuff wrong. But they, hey, you did, amen, you did a good job, buddy. Amen? But they don't have no new body. Their body's still in the ground or in an urn or spread across a lake or wherever some of y'all people think. Y'all shouldn't even be telling your family to do that. Don't ever tell them to put on a golf course, man. You know, I mean, what are you doing? So the thing is, but what happens is 
you're going to get a new glorified body when Jesus comes. When 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 happens, that has not happened. That is prophetic. That hasn't happened yet. And when that comes, then you're going to have a new body. But anyway, I'm just saying you'll have all of eternity to enjoy what you are missing right now. Amen? It's going to get better, I promise you. Because it can't get no worse. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It will. It will. I'm telling you. But what happens? But what, what, what are we preaching on tonight? Hope. Amen. Now you're going to listen. You said, Preach, I got hope now. Amen. <laughs> I'm going to hold on to that. And so now what happens here? Here it comes. Ready? So now they're there. They're being beat. All these things have happened. They lock them up. Look at, um, look at verse 22. It says, The multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates ran off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid, what, many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them there safely. Now, verse 24, who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks, which means they locked them down, they shackled them. And they actually, you know, I mean, hands and feet, so they're all in a bad way. All right, so, now I know that some of you probably had a bad day today, maybe, or a bad week. But, but it doesn't sound like, it doesn't look like you've had a day like that, you know, amen? And so let's just, let's just say for a minute that somebody may have had it worse than you. All right, let's just say that for a minute. Because, you know, most of the time when people are telling their stories, they got it worse than anybody, amen? You've heard them. You've heard them. And so it's just, it's just bad. And listen, life will get us that way. But what I'm saying is, these guys get in there, and let's just examine where they are for a moment. I guess one of the most discouraging things that has happened to me in my faith is that when I do right, it seems like everything can go wrong. You've been there in your faith. You, you actually made a conscious decision for the Lord, but now all hell broke loose. Amen. And so now, that's very discouraging because here's, here's our thought in our humanistic ways. Lord, I did right, so you should be blessing me. That's not what happened here. And I think it's important for us to notice and our hope is that just because you do right don't mean everything's going to happen right. What, what it actually means, you need to expect this sometimes. Sometimes when you did all right, everything's going to be all wrong. And because sometimes it'll make you question your faith when everything don't happen the way that you think it should happen. So now they're in there, and these guys are in a bad, bad way. They had a bad day, all because they've been living for the Lord. And now what happens is they're in there, they've been humiliated, they've been beat, they hurt, they're tied down, they can't move. And I think it's important to see that they cast them into the very inner part of the prison, which is the most the biggest lockdown area there it'd be like maximum security and they're locked down but then it says that something begins to happen and I, and I want to give you just a little bit of an outline here tonight okay because I, I think it's important for you to know that some people have it worse than you and I have it alright we need to know that because guys I'm going to tell you it's, we lose sight of that because of this country we live in I'm here man I listen to me we some spoiled, rotten American people. And everybody else in this world has got it a lot worse than what we got it. But what happened was, here they are now in a bad predicament living for Jesus. They got a choice to make. And in this choice right here, this is where a lot of Christians don't pass the test. This is where your faith is being tested. Because, see, it'd be easy right now to say if you can't be let's join them right now it'd be easy to say let's just give in so we can get out of this and what happens is they stand their ground <clears throat> and I think one of the biggest things is you know how the Bible teaches us in revelations that a lukewarm Christian makes God throw up it says it he'll he just spews it from his mouth I think that lukewarmness can be described in many different forms but I think that a complaining Christian is practicing lukewarmness. 
because right now you're complaining, but you're trying to practice your faith, so you're kind of straddling the fence. You're on middle ground. Because there's a lot of complaining Christians. And I really do think when Christians complain, Jesus stands up and throws up. Because what he's saying is, instead of taking your talk to people, you should go talk to the Lord. You should, you should pray to the Lord. And what Paul could be doing right now is doing a lot of complaining. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, he's got grounds to complain. I mean, he's done been beat. He's been, he could be sitting there, watch this. Here's another one. He could be asking the Lord, why? Why, Lord? But he doesn't do that. And so now he gets there and he says, you know what I'll do? He says, they took everything away from me. I have no clothes. I have no dignity. I don't even have a feel good to fall back on. He said, right now I am hurting and my flesh is burning. And in fact, this blood that's running from my body right now because you got to look up the word stripes and find out what that means. Stripes mean there was bloodshed because of this beat down they had. This wasn't you and your mom in a fly swat or a spatula. Trust me. This was a beat down. And so now in that respect, they're sitting there and he says, <clears throat> they took everything away from me, but I got a song to sing. Now listen, <clears throat> when you feel all alone, you need to sing a song. And in fact, they, some of you don't never need to sing till you all alone. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Am I telling the truth? I mean, if I'm not, somebody stop, stop me. Amen. I'm telling you that <laughs> there's still hope. Amen. <laughs> And so now what happens is they begin to, they begin to sing the song. And, and, and they start singing about how good the Lord is. And let me tell you how we know that because what it is is they're in there and this jailer's about to get saved. Now do you realize that the Bible teaches us in, in Romans that faith come by hearing and hearing of the word of God. There was a gospel message song being sung in efforts for that jailer to be able to hear the word of God so that he could prick his heart that he may be saved. So they wasn't singing a song of sorrows and woes, but here's what Paul said. He said, I can sing through my circumstances. See, when, when hope takes its stand in you, It'll be because you're living your life more than the circumstances. See, hope helps you look at the circumstances and say, I know somebody bigger than this. I have something that is greater than that. I have something that's more important than what I'm seeing right now. See, what happened was, now watch this church, ready? And, and I know this will be a lesson right here that it'll be hard to obtain, but if you can ever get it, it's going to help you finish your race. And that race is your faith until the finish line comes because we don't run a sprint, we're running a marathon. And so what happens is, with next time you're standing in a room and everything is bad, and everything you feel and all the vibes and all the, everything that's coming at you and you're being attacked. And please understand this. The people that can hurt you the most is the ones you love the most. Anybody you don't know, they might sting, they might stung you a little bit, but they cannot hurt you. You know, like I've said before, if somebody just walks up to Mar you know, from off the street, and they just get, they just give you a, just a smack down. I mean, just, just run you through the mill and just talk trash. Well, you're not going to like that. There's something going to rise up inside you a little bit, and you're going to be thinking about that nice little Christian headlock you could put them in. Amen? I mean, just squeeze them good and tight. Love you. Love you. Amen. You know, and it's going to be just loving on them. 
And, and, and so what happens is you, you kind of get to that place, but, but what's happening is now is, is God is saying, watch. If somebody comes up to you, though, that you love, watch this, and you trust, and they run you through the mill. See, what happens is that other person there can get in your head some, but that other person is going to get in your heart. You know why? Because they're already there. See, the person that you're already connected to, they already have a door that's open to your heart. And that's the person that can hurt you the most. <clears throat> what hurts you the most, ready? Is when the people that are closest to you seem to turn on you. And that happens. That's happened in your life, I'm sure, by this point. And it will happen again if you live long enough. But I want you to learn how to do this here for a minute. <clears throat> we are called in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, to walk by faith not by sight so what it teaches us is that everything you can see with your eyes is temporary and it will go away but everything you cannot see with your eyes is eternal and it will never fade so what it teaches us now is now watch we have the beat downs of life we have the humiliation and robbing us of dignity in our life. And I'm going to tell you, most things that will help shake and rattle your faith is encapsulated right here in Acts chapter 16. God was trying to give us a relevant word in Acts chapter 16 to put on display for you how to dig deep and find your hope when it seems like your faith is unraveling. When it feels like you're being persecuted because of doing right. When it feels like you are the minority because all the bad boys are majority. And so Paul dug deep. Now go there with me for a minute. Not necessarily, just, just imagine yourself naked for a minute. How about that? That good? And, not really. Now, right, let's skip right past that real quick. Imagine that. Let's, let's jump over here. I mean, you got, you got to come to life for you now, people. Because if I sit there and say they're standing over there in umbros and a wife beater, it ain't going to get no better. But, but, but now you imagine that's happening right there, all right? So you're already sad. And, 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 but you sadder because somebody else seen it size you in your mirror. Amen? All right. And so, so now you, you're being humiliated. Now when they do that, they, that was the thing about my mama. My mama loved to pull my britches down when she spanked me. Is that not the worst? I had already went in there and prepared and put on three days' worth before she got there. But she was like an onion. She'd peel back them layers. And woo-wee, my mama could swing a belt. I'm telling you right now, boy. And she'd do it till she got tired. I was already tired before she started. But, but, she, but anyway, I, I think it did some good. But, but she, she comes up there, and, and so what they do, they beat them down with nothing on. And now they put them in prison, and they lock them down, shackle them down. Church, I'm telling you right here, what made Paul and Silas sing was their hope in Jesus. You tell me what else did it. Was it because the piano started playing in there? Was it because somebody had come in there? He, here's what I'm saying. Guys, if you don't take Jesus with you in the prisons and in the embarrassments and the beatdowns of life, you have no hope anyway. And so what happens is you're going to find, and I believe, here's what I really believe. I really believe that there's somebody in this church tomorrow is going to have to try this on for size. And I believe you will be able to tell me about it come Sunday. I believe that. I feel that as I speak. And what's going to happen is you're going to have to think about this message tonight. And it is not going to be as important tonight when you lay your head on the pillow, but tomorrow when it comes to life, it will and the Holy Spirit's going to bring to your remembrance what you invested in tonight. 
And when that happens, you're going to see exactly what I'm saying is because it's going to seem like everything in that room is against you right now. And what you're going to have to do is look for what you cannot see with your eyes. And what you do is you, you, you let your faith in Jesus. See, what Paul was saying was, he says, you can strip me down. But I know somebody that's got a robe of righteousness for me. He says, you can beat me and put stripes on me, but I know one that says that by his stripes I am healed. See, what he was saying was, whatever it is you think you can take away from me, I know somebody and have hope in Jesus that he can restore me because he has something waiting for me. He says, you can beat me up, you can hurt me, you can curse me, you can spit on me, you can do whatever it is you want to me. He says, but I have hope in Jesus, the one who was crucified for my name's sake. He, I have healing because of the hope that I have in Jesus. He also says, he says, listen, you may have me in a prison, shackled down. He says, but I know somebody that I have hope in that has already set me free. And what he's saying is there is hope in Jesus. So what happened was, ready? He's saying now, I'm feeling it. Hey, listen here. He is saying on a Wednesday night in Effingham, South Kakalaki, with people that look like they have been up all day and all night. It says that right here, I'm telling you right now, church, that if we can get this and understand this tonight, that see, no matter what you going through, Jesus has already provided. What does he say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's saying that when you don't have a way, yes, you do. When you don't know the truth, yes, you do. When you think all is over and you don't have life, yes, you do. And he's saying that what you're doing is you're digging deep right now because if all Paul is seeing is what's in the room, he has no hope. If you are naked and beat down and shackled in a prison and the doors are shut, they have a jailer standing at the door. He's saying that, listen, I know somebody who kicked down the gates of hell, went in and took the keys, overcome death, hell, and the grave. What he's saying is, I see Jesus through all the trials of life. And anything you think you can take away from me, he has already provided for me. And my hope is in Jesus, not in what you think you can do to me. And no matter what you even do to me, I know somebody that can take the pain away. I know somebody who can give it back. So he says, take it as much as you want, but I know somebody who can give it back. I know somebody who can set me free from this. And guess what happened? When that hope started happening in that jail, the Bible says that, watch, the shackles come off. It says that the doors were open. It says that there was now freedom to go forth from what they were going through. So God is teaching us tonight, if you want freedom, if you want to be set free, if you want to be able to overcome whatever it is you are going through, you need to dig deep tonight and find hope. It cannot be on what you see. I've never seen Jesus Christ. I have never seen him with my eyes. And if I ever do, he's not forever. He's just temporary. As Paul taught us in the book of Corinthians, he says that if you see it, it is not permanent. It is not eternal. So what we have to do is be able to see Jesus. Now, how do we do that? Because we live our lives by faith and not by sight. Listen, if I live my life based on what I see in America and across the world today, I will die and go to hell. But I have hope that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. I have hope in my salvation. What did Paul teach us? He says, I know in whom I have entrusted my soul to. And now what it does is it makes you more confident as a Christian. It gives you joy and peace. Guys, I'm going to tell you right now. The thing about having hope in Jesus is this. You get to a place in your life and in your faith 
that just like Paul said, if I live or whether I die, he says to live is Christ and to die is gain. And I want you to know tonight, it doesn't matter what storm comes this way. It doesn't matter what, who, listen, it doesn't matter who is in the White House or, or who controls the Senate. These things, they matter, but ultimately they don't matter. It's not that we're going to fret. We just have hope in Jesus. And that will anchor our souls and keep us steady in a time of storm. And so I just want you to be encouraged tonight. And maybe just someone here needs to realize that if you'll find your hope tonight, you can find Jesus tonight. See, that's the way it was when we were lost and undone in our sin. It looked like it was over. But Jesus, he saved the day. So I just want you to be encouraged tonight. And know that it's not what you see. But sometimes you just need to close your eyes. And look. Because I'm going to tell you. Hope cannot be found with your eyes open. Hope can only be seen and found with your eyes closed. And so, don't be looking around tonight for your hope. But find your hope through your faith. And the Bible teaches us that is the substance that cannot be seen, but it can be found. And it's when we believe. Listen, tonight, I believe there is a Jesus. I believe that he is the only son of God. I believe that he came and lived and showed us how to be. He showed us how to overcome. He gave us a perfect example. I know we don't always follow that, but at least we always have that to fall back on. God's not looking for perfection tonight. God's just looking for people that will live like they are forgiven. That's all he wants. And in doing that, I want you just to lean back on your hope in Christ. And keep your feet on the rock. Stay steady. And just know that your hope is more than the circumstances in your life. The hope is more than the cares in this world. Your hope is in Christ. Will you stand with me tonight?